Okay, so um, let's now talk a little bit about the geological history of Mars and um, how, how scientists would start to go about reconstructing that history on a planet that we haven't even actually visited yet. Okay, so uh, geology section of the course. Telling time in geology is a critical aspect of trying to understand uh, the world around us. So if you're a geologist, you go hiking around in nature, on, uh, ideally. This is not what a lot of geologists end up doing, but, um, you know, if you're, if you're out about uh, looking at the landscape, what are the questions you want to address as a geologist? You know, why is the landscape set up the way it is? How did, how did it get to be there? What, uh, what, uh, um, better. Um, what are the processes that produce the, the world around us that we see today? And what, um, uh, what, um, impact have those processes had on the rocks and the minerals and if you're an economic geologist on the economic resources on where we look for oil where we look for different kinds of other uh, geological resources um, basically reconstructing the history of, a, of an area allows us to understand how it got to be the way it is and that uh, tells us a lot about the, the nature of that area. So, um, generally speaking, when we're talking about geological processes, we are talking about the action of these processes over immense amounts of time To result in the landscape we see today, uh, you know that's not very readable. But um, so you know processes like mountain building, processes like erosion, processes like continental drift, mm -hmm. they take place on a very slow time scale from a human perspective, but over millions and billions of years have a profound influence, a profound effect on on the planet around us. So with, um, you know, trying to reconstruct the history, a very important question is essentially what happened when? So we spend a lot of time, if, if you're a geologist, uh, trying to put dates on events that have happened in the past. And there are two basic approaches to do that. Relative dating gives you the order of events. But not necessarily absolute times. Whereas absolute dating clearly gives you I'll say exact dates within the resolution of the dating technique um, being used. So this image on the left, does anybody recognize which national park that is? Okay, Grand Canyon. You can't talk about relative dating of uh, geological structures without throwing up a picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, which of the, you, hopefully you can clearly see de, well-defined layers uh, in the vista uh, for the Grand Canyon there. Which of those layers do you think are older and which of those layers are younger? The top layers are? Younger. Older. I may say the top layers are older. I may say the top layers are younger. Why, why older? What's the argument that you would make that the top layers would be older? Because it doesn't like the ground 
Okay, so for for the top layers to be the older layers, then presumably something's going to have to be doing happening to create younger layers underneath. Okay. Okay, there's erosion uh, carved the canyon, but before that erosion occurred, there were processes that laid these layers down, and essentially those layers were laid down from bottom to top. By and large, geological processes that produce layers of new rock generally produce those layers of new rock on top of old rock. So if there is a lava flow, that lava is going to be spilling out of the volcano or the fissure or wherever it is come, wherever the magma is coming out of, and it will spread out on top of the existing land surface. If uh, the whole area gets covered by an ocean and you get sand and silt and other materials settling down from uh, being carried into the, uh, into the body of water, those layers are going to again pile up on the existing uh, bottom of the ocean. So generally speaking, unless something more interesting has happened, we're going to find younger layers uh, toward the top and uh, older layers toward the bottom. And uh, on Earth, we, uh, in the case of the Grand Canyon, for example, some of those layers of sediment contain fossils from ancient animals. And um, you can see the same kind of progression from, I, don't want, I hate to use the word more primitive, but from earlier forms of animal life uh, to later and more recent fossils, uh, the higher up you get. So relative dating gives you an order of events. You, in the case of the Grand Canyon, we can tell that the younger layers were, were produced later than the earlier layers, but we don't know if that was two years ago. Well, we know it's not two years ago. Uh, but we don't know if it was 5,000 years ago or 10 million years ago or 50 billion years ago. Um, and so that's the, uh, that's the situation that uh, early geologists and early paleontologists had to deal with. They could tell that there were, you know, these orders of the different rock layers, but they didn't necessarily know what kind of a, of a, of a time span they were dealing with. There are um, a variety of techniques that provide a more absolute date. Um, the, the most uh, prevalent of these is called radiometric dating. And there are a variety of different uh, radiometric dating techniques. They rely on the breakdown of radioactive elements in the minerals in the rock. Uh, we know from nuclear and particle <laughs> physics that the nuclear decay, the radioactive decay process occurs at a constant rate. Let's see, we don't have any analog clocks in the room anymore. Imagine there's, a, there's an analog clock over there with a second hand and a minute hand and an hour hand sweeping through to measure time. What do you need in order to have a clock, a something, a, a timekeeping process? How, how, how can we use that sweep of the second hand as a way of measuring elapsed time? Um, the what are the properties of that process that allow it to keep time? Okay, so there's that. Um, what would happen, how good a clock would it be if the second hand swept for a while then stopped and then went slow and then it went faster and then it slowed down again and it stopped? Uh, what would you, you throw out that clock, right? Because it's not good for uh, keeping time. Essentially, to uh, have some process that allows you to measure absolute time, 
you have to have some process that occurs at a constant rate and then you have to be able to measure how much of that process has happened. So in the case of the second hand, hopefully it sweeps out the seconds at a constant rate. So that rate at which the second hand goes around the clock is constant. And then by measuring how far that second hand has moved, we know how much of that process has happened so that we can translate that into a time. Same thing here with radioactive decay. Whether you're talking about radioactive uh, potassium decaying into, ra into argon gas or um, radioactive rubidium decaying into strontium or carbon-14, radioactive carbon-14 decaying into non-radioactive carbon-12. Those processes in general occur at a constant rate so that um, if we can measure um, if we know how much of the decay product has accumulated over time and how much of the original radioactive material has, di has disappeared then we can say how long it's been um, since that rock was formed, essentially. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, billions of years time scale measurement for potassium argon, or whether it's, you know, tens of thousands of years that carbon-14 um, uh, radioactive dating allows you to date. Okay. So, I mean, that's all I have to say about radioactive dating. We can't uh, really apply it yet on Mars because we don't have any Mars samples. But uh, we have something that we use instead that is quasi-relative, quasi-absolute. Uh, but just a, a few more principles of um, you know, using relative dating techniques to at least get the order of events um, in an area. There are these six main principles of... Are you chuckling about relative dating? Dating your relatives? No, we're chuckling about quasi. Okay. Quasi? Making a really good joke. About quasi? Okay. Okay. Um, basically, um, there are these rules you can use to tell which rock formations are, are younger, which rock formations are older, and therefore, uh, you know, the old rock formations give you an idea of what conditions were like at an older time when those rocks were produced, and the younger rocks, um, you know, tell a story about a younger environment. So, I mean, getting back to Mars, the reason why we want to know which sections of Mars are old and which sections of Mars are young is that the, the landforms, the kinds of rocks we see, the kinds of minerals we see can let us um, reconstruct what environments were like four billion years ago on Mars if we had four billion year old rocks. Whereas if we've got, you know, one billion year old rocks or rocks that are, are landforms that are, are younger than that, we can, you know, tell what kind of conditions occurred later in, in Mars's history. So super, superposition is just what we were talking about with the Grand Canyon. Generally speaking, um, younger on top, younger layers on top. Original horizontality means that, generally speaking, rock layers, whether you're talking about on the Earth or on Mars, are going to be laid down in horizontal layers. Lateral continuity and cross-cutting and inclusions we'll see in, um, in the next figure. But... Uh, you know, uh, essentially with uh, lateral continuity, 
if, if we had some erosion that cut away this middle part of this, uh, this uh, piece of these layers of rock strata, that's redundant, um, we could identify that this light layer over here is the same as the light layer we see in a different uh, uh, bed of deposits. Um, cross -cut cutting is essentially that any any rock layer that cuts across multiple other layers must be younger. Those other layers had to be there. For example, in the case of this intrusion of um, of uh, volcanic material, the sedimentary layers had to have been there before. So the cross cutting. stuff is newer in general. Um, inclusions, if we find bits of rock from one layer that have been actually incorporated into a new layer, clearly that rock layer that provided the inclusions had to have been there before the, the younger layer formed around the inclusions of the older layer. And then faunal succession is uh, what I, I mentioned with the Grand Canyon. We see older fossils at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, younger fossils at the top of the Grand Canyon. At this point, we have no idea if faunal succession has any relevance to Mars or, or not. Um, probably not. You know, only if we get very surprised and go to Mars and find that in the past there actually were large, complex, multicellular organisms that left fossils in the fossil record of Mars, uh, then we could use fossil <laughs> succession and we would all be very happy. Um, but, uh, the, you know, there's no guarantee that that's actually going to be the case. So I won't go through all of these transformations in general, but uh, if you actually look at a, at a specific area on the Earth or on Mars and try to reconstruct the geological history, it can be quite complex. I mean, in the case of this uh, diagram here, it starts off very simple in, in this figure where we've got, you know, this shallow body of water and over time there are different layers of sandstone and, and mudstone and other horizontal layers being laid down. But over time, um, you know, you can have stresses, forces that tend to um, jumble up those layers, deform those layers, bend them, uh, tilt them up on their sides, all sorts of, of transformations can occur. And um, as I mentioned in this case, we've got this inclusion of this uh, volcanic material that that um, cross cuts across those other layers. Um, then you have situations where you know erosion will come along and will erase a number of layers. So imagine some glaciers come along here and scraped off the top of this, um, and it might be submerged again into another uh, shallow sea where you have different layers of sediment laid down. And in this case, you've got this tilting, and all of these processes make the world a lot more complicated than what you would might hope for with this very simple situation of, oh, layers are laid down in turn, and we can read those rock layers. Uh, here's just a, another kind of uh, more realistic picture. Um, What principle would tell us that this layer of rock here is really the produced at the same time from the same processes as this other separate layer of rock over here on this other hill? Um, original, horizontality. original horizontality plus this idea of lateral continuity. 
that we're, we're making an inference that in the past, this rock layer was continuous across here. And why is that rock layer gone now? Erosion. Erosion. Some process, whether it's wind or water, um, you know, or this is a fairly broad river, uh, broad valley, so maybe it was a glacier that came through here and cut away those rock layers. So the, um, the rock layer that would join these two up is missing because of, of later removal, but you know, original horizontality and lateral continuity would make us fairly comfortable in saying, you know, we see the same layers on these two hillsides. Um, they're about the same width, they're the same uh, material. It's a pretty good bet that they were once one continuous set of, of layers that has been later cut. Um, which is a more recent rock? This uh, yellow stuff in here? or the gray brick-like stuff surrounding it? The yellow. The yellow. Why? It's cutting through this okay, it's, it's an intrusion. It's cutting across these other layers. Clearly those other layers had been laid down first, uh, and then later some process forced up, in this case, uh, since we're talking about uh, igneous rock, forced up this molten rock from down below that um, you know, cut across those layers. And so, you know, by looking at these different principles, you can kind of build up a history of what's happened in a given area, and, um, you know, by that, that reconstruction will allow you to not only uh, explain why we see the rocks we see today, but also allow us to infer what kind of conditions those rocks were laid down 10 million, 100 million, a billion years ago, whenever these uh, different strata were produced. Okay. Well, it's uh, actually spent a lot of time talking about this, but uh, clearly a lot of work has been done on the Earth to come up with a geological time scale for the Earth that includes not only this relative order with this transition from more ancient kinds of fossils to more and more and more modern fossils as you go further and further up in time in this geological time scale. We've got the advantage of um, you know, having radiometric dating available to us on the Earth to know that um, the Earth's Geological history goes back about 4.6 billion years. And um, again, we won't say a lot about this, but I will just point out that what we consider to be complex animals only arose about 550 to 6 million, 600 million years ago. So for most of the history of life on Earth, there were no complex animals. Um, earliest evidence for life is about 3.85 billion years ago in terms of small microbial uh, single-celled organisms. And then for about 3 billion years, there was basically nothing but, you know, microbes. Um, the age of the age of microbes uh, for those much for most of, of Earth's history. Okay. So now let's uh, let's start turning our attention to Mars. Here is a an image taken from orbit, obviously. This is in that Elysium Planitia area, the Elysium Plains, uh, nearby where we saw those volcanic uh, landforms when we were looking at the overview of Mars last time. 
14 degrees north, 200, west, 200 degrees west. Before we start interpreting this, what, what are the actual observations that you see looking at this image? Hunter. There are craters. These circular structures here, like here, and here, and here's a smaller one, and here's a medium-sized one, here's some little ones. Okay, so um, before we do interpretation, let's do observations. We see craters. What else? is an observation and not an interpretation looking at this. What, if you look at this, what do you see? Okay, we see... Let me ask you, is different elevation... <laughs> An observation or an interpretation? interpretation. Stephen thinks it's an interpretation. Okay, that's clearly an observation. We see dark, we see light. And then we got this dark area in the middle. I'll put elevation here kind of in the center. Where, uh, where do you see higher elevation and lower elevation? Go ahead. Like uh, in, up here? No, the other side. Over here? Well, uh, right there. It's okay. The way it's shaded, right over there, it looks like it's elevated. Okay, so we see, um, we can see some dark shading along this dark surface on the right side, and it's kind of matched up with light colored shading over here. Now, which direction do you think the light is coming from in this figure? Okay, so uh, you're interpreting this picture to say that uh, I think the light's coming down from the upper right. If that were the case, then yes, the, uh, the center dark area would be lower because you're basically seeing a shadow cast here and you're seeing um, you know, a bright highlighting here. Okay, so the dark area is smoother. Uh, texture was one of your other observations. So we've got the dark is smoother. Um, the dark area is less cratered. The dark area is less cratered. So that that's an observation. Fewer craters on the dark area. The light's actually coming left to right. And if anything, it's probably coming a little bit from the lower left to the upper right. So that, how does that uh, affect our interpretation of the highlighting and the uh, shadowing? Okay. Yeah. So I I have trouble all the time. Um, I you know look at some of these images from orbit, and you know if I don't look at them quite right, I get uh, essentially craters uh, sticking up and uh, um, you know small volcanoes sticking down. 
getting a handle on you know, using those light and shadow cues um, can be an issue. But yes, in this case, we do have, um, you know, this is, uh, the light is coming in from this direction. So here we have that dark, smoother, lower cratered um, landform, essentially casting a shadow onto the lighter colored, uh, more heavily cratered landform. So which of these landforms is on top of the other? The dark ones on top. Okay, so our interpretation would be Dark is on top, and if it's on top, uh, do we interpret it as being younger or older than the surrounding area? Younger. Okay. And what other observation that's already up on the board here supports that? Fewer craters. Fewer craters. Okay. So... Um, you know, looking down at this particular spot from orbit, um, you can figure out, well, what are the actual pure observations that I can make? I see light areas, I see dark areas, I see differences in crater density in the different areas. I see these um, shadowing and highlighting uh, areas. I see differences in texture. Um, once you've got those, then you can begin to build up an interpretation of this area. So we had essentially an older, rougher, cratered surface, and um, it's been covered over by a younger, smoother surface. What, uh, what, do you th what process do you think probably resulted in this material Flowing out and covering over that older surface. Okay, so this this is indeed you know, the the end of a lava flow from uh, some nearby volcanoes. Remember, this is in that Elysium region where we know there's volcanic activity or volcano morphologies, and so. Um, you know, our interpretation of this would be, you know, we've got this original older surface, and it's older, it's more textured, it's have more heavily cratered because it's older, and then at a younger age, you know, some uh, volcano uh, put out this lava flow, and the lava kind of uh, filled in in the areas where it could, and smoothed over and covered over those old craters, that old rough terrain, with a fresh new surface, but it has been a while since that lava flow occurred because what do you see on that lava flow? New craters. New craters. Okay. So yes, it's got fewer craters because it's younger, but it does have craters, so that means it has been around for a while. Um, so, um, I mean, that's, that's an um, example of the kind of, of interpretation, building up an interpretation that you can do with these images. And it also highlights very much this use of crater density as a way for us to identify very old surfaces versus younger surfaces on Mars. Okay. So yeah, we, we see it was a lava flow, we've got the principle of superposition and original horizontality working here. We can use those crater densities uh, to get an idea of which is the older surface, which is the younger surface. And hopefully you, know, you put all those together and it kind of all makes sense. Um, and, you know, it makes sense that the lava would flow on top of the older surface and be younger and have fewer craters. Okay, so I want to focus a little bit on this use of craters in particular to, um, to date different surfaces on Mars. Um, 
William Hartman um, has done a lot of, of the work in this area. There's a, another researcher from Germany uh, who has also spent a lot of time you know, looking at crater densities in different areas on Mars to try to build up a large-scale uh, you know, view of the history of Mars. And we won't go through the abstract here. <clears throat> so we don't have any samples from Mars that we can date using radioactive decay, but we do have samples from the moon that will allow us to date the um, age of you know, particular parts of the moon that the Apollo astronauts went to and uh, parts of the moon that the Soviets sent their um, robotic uh, sample return missions to. When you count craters of different sizes, and plot them on a scale like this, this is the kind of figure you get. And we won't go into all the nitty-gritty and gory details of this, but basically we're talking about uh, counting up large craters and medium-sized craters and small craters and seeing how many of them are there are. And for large craters, do we find lots of large craters in an area or few large craters in an area? Okay. So, if we look at the small craters, there's tons of them. If we look at the large craters, they're not very many at all, and medium-sized craters are somewhat in between. Why do you have a lot more small craters on the moon or on Mars in a given area than you have large craters? What's going to determine the size of a crater impact? Size of whatever. Size of the thing that's smacking the moon. Okay? And if you look out in space, there's a whole lot of small crap floating around. And fortunately, at this point, there's not a lot of large crap floating around. And so you would expect to find, if you looked at any given area, you would expect to find you know, a smaller number of large craters, and then when you get to smaller and smaller and smaller crater sizes, you'd expect to find more and more and more of them, because those, um, that ammunition is a lot more common than the large impactors. So this would be uh, the situation for a fairly old area that has had enough time to accumulate a saturation level of craters. If you had a brand new area that had just been formed from, a, say, a fresh lava flow, how many large impact craters would be on that? Brand new, brand, brand, brand new area. Okay, then, none. then none. How many small craters? Probably still none, because I'm saying it's brand spanking new. Okay, So an area will start off with no small craters, no medium-sized craters, no... <laughs> okay, no large craters, because it hasn't had any time to accumulate any crater impacts at all. Over time... The longer that area sits around, the more likely it is that it's going to be smacked from space. Which size craters are going to build up soon, soonest, most fastest? Small ones. So, you know, a young area might have a small number of really small craters and maybe even a very small number of medium-sized craters, but not have been around long enough to accumulate any really large craters. So here is a very young, new surface. And over time, as the surface sits around and uh, it is the target for target practice longer and longer and longer, then the number of impacts are generally going to increase in all categories in some kind of predictable fashion. 
And so by, you know, where these lines are basically gives you a uh, measure of whether the surface you're looking at is young or old. And uh, ideally, would do more than just that relative amount of dating. If we know how rapidly craters accumulate, um, then we can actually put real numbers on, on these different lines that we would see. That's essentially what has been uh, tried to be applied to all of the terrestrial planets and the moon. So we've got you know, crater densities of different areas on the moon, crater densities in different areas on Mars, on Mercury, not so much on Venus. Um, and so uh, um, you know, this provides us a way to kind of build up a history of these different areas. But, um, I won't go through a lot of this stuff, skip over it. But this is essentially what has been set up for Mars based on some different assumptions. So if you've got an area that is very young, only 10,000 years old, that line showing the mix of large and small craters is going to be shifted over here to the left and down. Whereas areas that are three and a half billion years old will have a lot more craters in all of the size ranges. Um, so by you know, looking at an area like this that has very few craters, what would you say in terms of its age? It's young. Very young. Uh, um, you know, this is just an example of some of the kinds of data that have been collected to put different absolute dates on different areas. So here is an area in the Amazonas Planitia region, which is somewhat young. And um, the crater densities are kind of scattering here between the 100 million year old to 1 billion year old range. So kind of old compared to us. I mean, 100 million years ago, 500 million years ago, a billion years ago. But in terms of the history of Mars, that's, you know, on the young side, right? Same thing. Um, you can identify different areas of different ages. Yeah, let me just breathe because you're going to get... But the take-home message is that um, by doing all this work, the history of Mars has been broken down into these three main time periods. The Noachian era which is named after an uh, area of Mars called Noachus, which is very old, very heavily cratered. Um, then there's this middle range of time period for Mars called the Hesperian. And then the Amazonian is, uh, you know, even younger still. So roughly the first billion years of Mars is represented by this very old terrain that's heavily cratered, a lot of large impact structures. There was, um, <laughs> as we'll talk about um, later, you know, this area, this era of very high uh, bombardment early in the history of, of Mars and, and Earth. And um, when we get to the climate and water section, we'll spend a lot of time talking about trying to really reconstruct what Mars was like after it was first formed, uh, in that first billion years after it, uh, it was formed. Because we know on Earth, that's the time that life was developing. We know that life, uh, that Earth was, you know, it was warm, it was wet, and so forth. The question was, that we'll address is, you know, how warm and wet was Mars uh, early in its history? Because we know... You know, late in its history, it's cold, it's dry, it's dusty, um, not so um, conducive to life now. But remember those time periods, you know, the Noachian, the Hesperian, and the Amazonian, those kind of make up these uh, major chunks in the history of Mars. Okay.